So she was a friend of Grandma's. Yeah. And they didn't have any children. Mark. That's what they called her. Hmm. We went there about eight times, I remember. Mm. So was she back from the Gladdy Mance sort of days and those things? Yeah, I'm not too sure. She didn't live nearby, did she? She lived a fair way away. No, she lived reasonably close. But she wasn't all that far away. In my memory. Mm. So did Alf have any relatives around the area? He had his assistant. Um, well, Leone was one of the daughters, um, and there were two boys. Um, hmm. What was his sister's name? Anyhow, she, the mother, uh, divorced the boys because they didn't do what she wanted them to do and Leone got everything mm. and uh, when when the old girl died Leone didn't tell the boys oh, sure. that their mother had died that's fairly serious isn't it yes there was um, a medal that I've got it's a silver medal A. Cox no, 1891 top um, runs for the season MCC mm -hmm. and I took a photograph of it which didn't quite work out right and sent it off to the Melbourne Cricket Club asking because they lived in North Carlton it makes sense they would have played there wouldn't it yeah. mm -hmm. and um, asking can you tell me what his average was, his batting average was that one in 1891 in uh, a. Cox. So I don't know what Alf's father's name was, but obviously it was an A would be the initial word. Yeah, he was a stonemason. That put these top stone... He worked on the lines mm. of the... Um, what do you call it? The Queen's College and the Cathedral. He put the top pieces on, wasn't he? Yeah, we worked on the lines of the, uh, not the Sphinx, um, oh, the Shrine. Yeah. Yeah, he worked on that. So did you meet him and know him? Mm -hmm. Who was the one that got, that was, Nancy's father got killed by a Gerda, Gerda walking down Collins Street, mm -hmm. when she was a little girl, but her mum died soon afterwards, wasn't it? Yeah, well, her mother, um, owned several boarding houses and quite a lot of property in Carlton mm -hmm. and, the, and the husband drank it all right and he was walking down the street and, and something fell off a building site and, and killed him and at that stage they were in pretty poor circumstances because he drunk a lot mm. and uh, so then the answer was uh, when, when the mother died she found she was adopted and uh, then of course the trouble started because she was on her own she had to work in one of the shoe manufacturing places shoe factories in uh, Collingwood in order to survive but the mother of, I've forgotten the name the mother's name or adopted mother's name hmm Mary Ann Maloney where did that come from? Well, Maloney was the name of the adoptive parents. Gaynor was that was her mother's name. Hmm.
Thanks, Lynn. So the mother was predicted, of course, and a terrible um, thing in those days for a girl to get pregnant before marriage. Her mother? Yes. <coughs> so she was adopted out, and um, the mother went on to marry, remarry, or to marry. Uh, somebody and he didn't obviously didn't realise that she'd been predicted and she went on to have several more children and that's where the uh, the relatives came in in, in uh, New South Wales the nun in Canada well the nun was the sister of her mother we don't know that though do we? yeah we definitely do. All right. Because Nancy's mother was the eldest of the family, mm -hmm. and um, the, the nun, what was her name? Um, Sister Mary, uh, Mary Baptist. Mary Baptist. And she became a nun. And her sister became a nun as well. Yeah, another sister. Sisters of Mercy. You've heard Jeremy's joke about the mercy. Have you? Oh, it's yeah, something about it. The chap's going through the Malabar and his vehicle's broken down. He's been walking for two days and he's just about dead. And he comes up and there's a little sign that says the mercy. And he says, oh. And of course, what it is is an Aboriginal mission out there for the Mercy Sisters out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And he staggered along with extra breath and life, telling he's giving him the mercy. And he comes there, and a few nuns come up and say, Oh, we're, you're lucky we've got you. We will save your life. And they said, We've got this special thing we have here to revigorate, you know, people that are stuck in your circumstance. We'll just start a fire. Come on, children, collect some sticks, and we'll start a fire. And we'll brew a pot of our special koala tea. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and needless to say, they have the thing with the koala tea. And they offer him the sip, and he's just on his dying legs. And, he, and he's spitting out the words of fur from the koala. as between his clenched teeth, but it's better than nothing. And he said, um, it's got a lot of fluff in it, it shouldn't be strained. They said, no, the koala tea of mercy should not be strained. <laughs> Equality of mercy is never strange. Hmm. Yeah, well, what was his name again? Um, Jerry Longley. Jerry Longley, yeah. What happened to him? He did 18 months in jail as a um, convicted pedophile. Oh, pedophile. Oh. Right, that's right. So you haven't heard anything more about him? Um, I've probably spoken to him once a year since then. Mm -hmm. um, he's hiding out now. They had to move house and move yeah, family and move everything. Um, I still don't believe he ever re-offended. And it was an offence done as a 23-year-old without penetration. It was purely mystical. It was a group of like... 16 and 17 year olds with a 23 year old boarding master sitting around a camp mutually wanking each other. That's right, yeah. yeah. And there was sev never any suggestion that there was penetration or anything else. It was mutual wanking. He was wanking them and they were wanking him. And he was a, tw a immature 23 year old with polio who was, had a bad personal view. And I personally think that that makes sense. Hmm. And that the opportunity to re offend at Geelong College was enormous. Yeah. And I think generally that when they convict these guys and give them a fairly severe penalty, the assumption is that they, they're recidivist um, acts. Yeah. And my first thing was to ring John Laidlaw and eight or ten other boarders from the boarding house and ask them the question, Did, was Jerry fucking the boys? Mm. And the answer was no. Mr Hatton was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mr, um, what's the Scottish one that used to live on the house up there? Oh, he was. Uh, they could name between um, 
and who was the one that we used to go around to, who was the defrock monk method the, um, the, there was about eight or nine mm. in the boarding house that we could name and an equal amount of Geelong Grammar that were known to have the boys and if I suppose if you ask Bill Redpath and Andrew Robb and those boys they can tell you exactly who they were because mm. they were rooting each one of them um, and probably getting sucked mm. off as well um, mm -hmm. but Jerry wasn't on the list and so I actually wrote my submission into the court saying that you know I'm, I'm aware that he's pleaded guilty to this but in considering the um, the sentencing that you should consider that in the 12 years that I know and I've researched heavily at Geelong College when the opportunity was clearly available um, he I'm, I'm, I don't believe talking to boarders and I thought that he's ever re um, yeah. reoffended mm. and I think this should be con taken into consideration in his sentencing that he was punished at the time and moved across the country and received that punishment and it's a, and you're punishing him again for a thing where he hasn't reoffended. Now what a couple of people talked to me and this was um, I can't even think not Whitten um, boarding master very respectable chap he actually rang me and told me about it originally and I think of his name he was at M Mackey House for many many years and he was astounded as well that could understand it um, and we discussed it and said don't you ever he said to explain to me don't you ever realize that when a master turned up in May or June halfway through the year and another master from Geelong College suddenly disappeared because he had a sick aunt in or aunt in England he had to go and look after that's when they were caught each time mm. and the standard thing in the GPS schools was you send them to the other end of the earth and give them another chance mm. and mm. so that's when these masters went to English schools and English masters turned up in Australian <laughs> schools um, the assumption being that they'd learnt their lesson or and, and the system actually covered them because it's a bit like if the shareholders find out that affects the share price so we'll deal with it internally now the argument is that was the culture of the day mm. um, but clearly it was endemic and I think we were all very open at home and the issue of homosexuality and all those things was always discussed where I think other people would pretend it didn't exist so I think we had a particular household and clearly when we had the, the John Herds and other people coming up with gay faggots that were <laughs> the extreme um, I can always remember we had one dinner at, when I was probably at uni um, at Aaron and you realise that round the table we had like five gay men it was John Hurd and all his cronies John and Graham yeah. and there was a few others there and I think even you made some comment oh shit we're entertaining faggots all the time or something <laughs> like that well, I don't know what your word was it wasn't faggot but it was that and I think that's probably about the last time you had the whole lot of those arty people round mm and you realise that well, they weren't actually your normal friends anymore but they were putting off your other friends yeah. remember Graham, Graham's boyfriend was out in the car in the front no oh, I can't remember One of the, uh, a soldier I think Lad, there was yeah. Lad yeah. Ian Lad was it, who was at the music teacher at Geelong College mm. well this fellow was uh, in the army and he was most upset that Graham was in there and he wasn't yeah. and uh, Graham had to go out and pacify him because the other fellow wasn't invited to Aaron. Yeah, that was an uh, interesting night. It's funny that uh, there were three children, three boys, and the one family were all homosexual. Mm. Well, the other one was the Chernside's um, yeah. rally's brother, wasn't it? Brother-in-law. Who lived on the property or something, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And that rally used to be the homophobe. Yeah, and really never ever realised that the brother-in-law was a boofter. Like, to me that's just an amazing thing, isn't it? To mm. be totally unaware that they're, they're so evil and foreign. I, like even Roy's things the other day, I actually felt like, well, I'm a guest, I'm not going to, it's not worth wrestling it. Mm. But, um, yeah, Roy but I'm sitting there thinking, we still don't even know what Paul is really, do we? True. And well, Roy's certainly homophobic. Mm. And I'm sitting there thinking of, well, what does Paul go out with? Do you know? 
when he disappears for hours. Well, he goes out with the fellas. Yeah. But they mostly run, as far as I can make out. Oh, good luck, yeah. Yeah, but uh, he did have this uh, Filipino woman and, uh, with whom he went to the Philippines. Hmm. And whether he's rooting her or not, nobody would ever know. Or her brothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. uh, Julie doesn't know, and I certainly don't know. Yeah, strange situation. I can't understand people who so oh, bloody puffed us, you know, they ought to be hung, drawn, or quartered or something. And the poor bastards, they've got no control over their feelings. Mm. That's the way they're made. And uh, you, you can be very theoretical about it and say, okay, it, it's influenced by the amount of female hormone in, in the. We well, don't know what does it actually. That's what's no, the tricky than that. We don't know. It's one of the theories is that they are influenced by female hormones in the uterus. And um, but uh, what does a fucking man have for God's sake? Well, my answer is they get on well with women and they don't want to root them. So um, yeah. they'd only be competing with us, and we'd be more pissed off if they were. <laughs> That's right. uh, yeah. But the bisexual ones are the ones that interest me. How they can have it both ways. I suppose when you think about it, it's not a bad way to be. Well, you, 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 you increase your chances of That's getting right. success, wouldn't yeah, you? You've got twice the number. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I'm going to watch the footy. Yeah. Again. The girls, um, oh, you know, I've got the two lesbians in the office with me. Yeah. yeah. And Karen said when we first moved around the office and her lesbian partner owns the building, and she said, oh, do you mind if we put some girly pictures up in the toilet? in the staff toilet I said oh that's fine by me I'm sitting there thinking and I was talking to others there saying I don't know what would they look like will they be like playboy pin ups or will they be reshaven headed dykes you know we're, mm -hmm. we're all curious to think <laughs> what a dykes look at and then she came back a week or two later she said oh, I better not because I think the reception is straight she might be offended if we put them up there and Mark and myself and a couple of others around because we discussed it I said oh I'm really curious to what they would put up there. Mm. And I told you that um, we had the, the lesbian couple at the front of the house in Tristani when Tim was little. Yeah. And they've split up now since, which was a very hostile split, in fact. It's been quite nasty. But um, oh, when Tim was probably seven or something like that, we were at one of their barbecues at their new house with the pool, but it had the one double bed. We all went and used the toilet off, in the ensuite off the bedroom. And Tim worked out like all their things were in one room in a double bed and nothing else is in the spare room's empty. And he came to me and said, like, they're a couple, aren't they, Dad? And I said, yeah, yeah. Like, two girls. Yeah, there's two girls, that's right. What do they do? <laughs> and I said, well, why don't you go and ask Lynn that for me and find out for me? So, you know, a nice seven-year-old goes up to Lynn and says, Lynn, <laughs> and <laughs> asks the question. And she says, tell your father he can keep guessing. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn was like over there, uh, and Tim went over uh, to her. Uh, uh, and, she, and I said, what did she say, Tim? And Lynn's looking at me when Tim came running back. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, Lynn definitely wore the pants in the arrangement, so um, yeah. I think she did the writing. Well, at Kevin Threlton's place, as you know, it was a, a private hospital next door, a small mm. place. And the, uh, the the woman that ran that was a big beefy le uh, lesbian female, and Kevin said he was at a party one night, and she was there with a lot of other lesbians, and she stuck on a big dick. The the strap on. Yeah. Well, I've asked the question about the strap on, and most of them have denied it. Said, "Oh, no. what do we want to do with the boys' thing? We just use tongues." No, oh, right. that's an yeah, answer. Yeah. So the strap on thing. Um, Lynn and Jeanette, I think, had got one once. We actually talked about it, and um, there was a place I was getting some dodgy movies from in Sydney, and they had a special um, strap-ons that are actually soft, pliable, with well-fitting harnesses and things are like hundreds of dollars. Mm. They, you know, there's lots of toy sex toys, but ones that actually work have to be nicely anatomically designed and everything else. And they have one where the piece fits in one girl, but it fits in the right position at front so they can both feel what they're doing. And um, I was actually saying, I went to a place and they had a bargain sale in like the front thing. 
of all these good quality strap-ons for 30 bucks each. I actually said it to a couple of lesbian friends and a couple of said, oh, I've always wanted to try one of those good ones, but they're, they're too expensive. So I was just hinting to see whether I'd get a bite with a lot of things. And they said, they're meant to be really good, though, but, but they're 300 I said, yeah, but if you've got anyone going to Sydney, I can tell you where they're on special at the moment. And I actually had the thought that it would be one of those funny things to... You'd probably get a slap in the face or something else, or or thanks, you've changed our our <laughs> sex life completely, um, and no, you can't watch. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was so. The interesting thing, even when Terry Holt, my audiologist, who was gay with her partner, and she used to say um, she worked with me for about four years. Terry died of cancer at 32, uh, mm. breast cancer, mm. six weeks from diagnosed to death, and she had. Flutter, he had as many boobs as I've got. Flutter's mm. attack would have been nothing there. But um, Terry used to say, you know, all those old maids that lived together down the street, said, what, yeah. what do you think they were? Yeah. And, uh, well, closet lesbians. Yeah, well, no, they, said they were lesbians, but yeah. no one expected when yeah, well, two women lived together all their life that they actually were sexually active. I'm trying to think of the babysitters like Mrs. Burroughs and <laughs> yeah. now she lived up the top of the hill there. Remember old Mrs. Burroughs yeah. with her brother that collected stamps. Yes. Yeah. And he lived in the lean-to on the side of the place mm. with all these penny black stamps mm. that were worth a squillion dollars each. The way they were going the final bush for all these stamp collection. Mm-hmm. He had a lot of um, Indian. And I think he had Af- Afghanistan. Richard Duval has got um, a very... He's got one of the world's collection of Afghanistan stamps. Oh. And he was saying to me that um, a number of the ones he's got, which were the early British Raj um, stamps were posted there, um, there are uh, uh, $10,000 and $30,000 stamps because they're the only ones all known in the world of that particular stamp and he's got mm-hmm. them all put away in vaults and looked after but his collection is that and he's actually written a book on Afghanistan stamps I'm thinking yes so here's his book and he said no no there's collectors in the world that collect colony stamps and to get those last ones to complete their collection is what they pay the money for Hmm. and without those ones it's like without having a penny black in your collection but there's squillions of penny blacks I think they're only worth 50 bucks each now still Mm. But stamps are obviously right out of fashion at the moment. They, you know, you put them on envelopes. If you've got um, mint stamps anymore, they're not worth anything. Yeah, well, I've got a lot that I've had for thirty odd years. I'm um, using them to send letters to mates in America. Mm. Well, that's about what they were because the Australian Post killed it all when they released all their archival stock. Mm. So I've bought albums of 1950s stamps um, with all mint ones. Tim had them when he was interested for a while. And you realise I ducked down to the stamp dealers in Sydney and I was buying current um, decimal stamps in mint condition for half their face value. Mm. And I said to the guys in the shop, um, but these are still usable. He said, yeah, but we can't sell them. (laughs) So I was going and buying all these... 30 year old stamps and putting them on envelopes mm. and it was half a postage cost but I had to lick four stamps instead of one <sighs> yeah well, I've got a similar situation mm. I've got piles of the buggers but whether it comes back in again is the catch <laughs>